Hello and welcome to WooStream, bringing Willamette's campus to you. For today's webinar, Understanding America's Border Crisis, Part 3, A Way Forward, we have Professor Warren Binford joining us to talk about the current state of the U.S. border crisis and its effect on children. Warren Binford is a professor of law and the director of the Clinical Law Program at Willamette University College of Law. She is a globally recognized children's rights scholar and advocate collaborating with numerous domestic and foreign NGOs. Her contributions have been of incredible value to issues both nationally and internationally. Please be aware that this webinar will be recorded for future viewing. If you have a question during the presentation, please use the question tab and we will save time at the end for Warren to respond to as many questions as possible. And now, here's Professor Binford. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you for having me here today, and thank you to all of you who are joining from home and from your offices. This is the third and final installment in our three-part webinar focused on understanding America's border crisis, and today we're going to talk about a way forward. A lot of people make it seem as though there is no way forward with this current crisis, but uh, I, I disagree with that. I'm gonna just stop for a second and ask for technical assistance because I'm having a hard time moving this PowerPoint forward. So if we could just get IT in here so that we can control the PowerPoint, that'd be great. So let me, there we go. Okay, so one of the first things that we need to do in order to overcome the current uh, border crisis is to reframe our thinking. I hear from people who might stereotypically be focused on the right or the left who have different views about the border crisis that I think holds us back from really uh, coming up with a reasonable solution to what we have witnessed the last three years. The first one is the idea that we can just have open borders and that it's no, no problem to let people come and go. Uh, the fact is, is that in what I've witnessed at the border, the work that I do related to child sex abuse, child trafficking, et cetera, I think it's important for us to accept the fact that borders matter and that it in fact is the government's responsibility to maintain a, a, a safe and orderly border. At the same time that we recognize national sovereignty though, and the role that government plays in creating a secure society, it's important for us to also know that people matter and that because we recognize that people matter and that we exist not only as a nation but as part of a larger global community, it's important for us to recognize that we need to have migration, that migration is an inevitable, that we have political crises, we have wars, we have also, we, ha we have right now, you know, a pandemic, that we of course have natural uh, disasters which create the need for people to migrate and that migration is healthy, that it's important to have an influx of new people coming into regions, it's important to have new relationships, it's important for us to have new labor opportunities, more new uh, ideas coming into a society, and so allowing for a moderate level of migration is something that's desirable. In addition to that, we need to plan for the inevitable, which is that there sometimes will be surges in migration because of these natural disasters, because of these wars, because of uh, biological crises, that we need to be ready for when we have migration that is greater than we might have anticipated or expected, and we have to have a system that adapts to those surges. And then, most importantly, it's critical that we develop systems here in the United States that are humane, that are effective and that are cost efficient. And these are some of the failings that we've talked about during our first two parts of this webinar series. The second thing that we need to focus on is that it's important for us to all work to educate one another. The public and policy makers need to understand what the facts are. And one of the greatest frustrations that I've had this, these last few years when I've been trying to work on this crisis is that many people just don't understand the law or the reality. And a lot of people don't understand the history of the United States and the ways in which we've created to the border crisis that we've been witnessing these last few years. So an example of something that a lot of people don't understand is that there is a difference between immigration law and asylum law. Immigration law really focuses on people who come to the United States um, 
usually lawfully with proper documentation in order to study here, in order to work here, or because they have applied for a documented immigration status in relation to their family and they were given preference because of their family here. That's a very different area of the law than asylum law. Asylum law is really focused on providing a system for refugees to enter into a country because they are not protected in their home country or in the source country where they came from. A lot of the surge that we've seen in recent years is not of immigrants so much as of asylum seekers. And it's really, really critical for folks to understand something that we went over previously is that when someone comes to the United States for the purposes of immigration and they're coming here, for example, for a job and when they don't have appropriate documentation, it is unlawful. However, when they come to the United States for the purpose of seeking asylum and they don't have appropriate documentation, it is lawful. In addition to that, we talked about the fact that although it may be unlawful for someone to come to the United States for the purpose of getting a job without documentation, it is a very minor violation of the law. It is something that is the equivalent, if it's a misdemeanor, that is the equivalent of you or I playing music too loud. And so a lot of the actions that the government has taken in response to those misdemeanors, such as taking parents away from their children, is vastly disproportional to the um, illegality that's committed. But for the purposes of focusing on the people who come to the United States without documentation for the purpose of seeking asylum, saying United States have come to you for protection, I am being uh, raped in my home country and the level of corruption of the government is so great that they're not able to protect me, that, I'm, that a gang has targeted me, they're trying to force me to join their gang, I'm a 14 year old child who wants to stay in school, please protect me. These people are subject to a different set of laws than immigrants and those asylum seekers are supposed to be treated uh, in such a way that it's not deemed illegal for them to come without documentation and they are supposed to be given certain court processes that other immigrants are not entitled to. Another area where we have to have um, more education of both the American public and policymakers is with regard to what's actually happening on our border, what's happening to the children and families in America's care. And this is really what brought me into this issue is that as a children's rights expert, I ended up stumbling into this scenario where our children and families who are in US custody are having their rights vastly violated to the point that we have witnessed, those of us who have gone into some of these facilities have witnessed widespread institutional abuse and neglect of children who have been entrusted to the United States government. But it's important for us to educate the public about the fact that most of these children and most of these families don't need to be there. 89% of the children who were released from government custody last year after being after surrendering surrendering themselves to uh, government authorities, in fact, were placed with families or other guardians here in the United States, other loved ones here in the United States. So these are children who don't need to be in custody to begin with, and even for the short period of time that they are in government custody, their rights absolutely should never be violated. In addition to that, we need to make sure that the American public and public policy makers, this includes both our political leaders as well as the people that they hire in their administration and who are implementing you know, the laws and the regulations, we need to make sure that they understand that there are far more affordable ways for us to manage these children and their families than the way that they have been managed in, in recent years. So that, for example, it's far less expensive to place a child with their family in the United States than it is to keep them in a place like some of the places that I've visited, Casa Padre, which is the Walmart, or the tent city, the tent city at Torneo, et cetera. 
For example, there's been a whole study that's been done about what would it cost if you provide wraparound services to a family here in the United States and you track where it is that they are, you provide them with a, a, a legal counseling, legal representation, and have them check in on a regular basis. They report where they're working, they report where they're living, et cetera. And what we find is that when you provide these wraparound services, you have near complete compliance with appearing at court dates and doing what the government authorities ask of them. And this is far less expensive than, for example, doing what the current administration proposed, which was to place thousands of families in detention in abandoned military bases and carrying them for the, caring for them for months or even years in those facilities. It's simply unnecessary and it's far more expensive than what the other options are. So it's really important for us to make sure that everybody understands that it's not a situation that uh, if we don't lock these children and families up, that we're going to lose track of them, we're going to lose control of them, because that's just not true. There's been research around this, and there are more, are more uh, cost-effective alternatives. So in addition to educating the public and policymakers about what the facts are and, and what needs to be done, it's important that we recognize as a nation that we need to completely overhaul immigration and asylum law here in the United States, that it needs to be updated. Right now, what we have is a, a fractured and inhumane system where children are harmed and unjust results are routinely um, given out. So that, for example, we have a lot of power right now invested in the attorney, attorney general of the United States. And even though he has no expertise in this field, he has eliminated some of the most critical protections for women and children who come to the United States seeking asylum. Um, he has eliminated a recognition of certain groups of uh, children and, and women who are being targeted in certain source countries. And we can't allow this to happen. In addition, it's critical that we understand that right now, the families and children who are coming into the United States seeking asylum, uh, that they are not being provided with legal representation and that even the attorneys who want to help them and represent them on a pro bono basis aren't being given access to them when they are, for example, in Customs and Border Patrol facilities. This is a violation of basic due process principles, which is something that we need to be following in moving our country forward and updating our immigration and asylum laws and so that they produce humane and just results. These basic due process laws include not just legal representation, which by the way, significantly increases the likelihood that children are granted asylum. There have been some studies that have shown that approximately 40% of the children who are coming to the United States without documentation are in fact, they meet the criteria for asylum under US law. And yet when children are not represented, and this includes infants and toddlers and preschoolers who have to go to court with any attorneys uh, accompanying them, let alone representing them, that when they are represented, their likelihood of success goes up to over 80% in many cases. And so what we really need is for these children and families to have legal representation, to make sure attorneys have access to them, and that the hearings be fair. There are places right now in the country where there is literally no asylum granted ever. And this makes no sense because we know enough about these children and families and we know the legal uh, bases for asylum that we know that this is not a just result. I, as you already know from the first slide, I'm not an open borders uh, advocate. I'm not someone who says that every person who wants to come to America should be given the ability to do so. That's just not practical. But what I do think is that when we have laws, we need to follow them and that those laws are intended to produce a certain result, which allows for a reasonable number of people to come to the United States based on claims for asylum and for, those, uh, for that asylum to be granted to them. And that's not what we're seeing in many parts of the country and in certain courts. We're seeing these as asylum deserts is what they're called because none of the claims are ever granted. In addition to that, we are also witnessing a large number of people, not just adults, but children too, who are being imprisoned for extended periods of time without 
any trial. This is a violation of basic due process principles. So it's critical that we end this imprisonment without trial that we're witnessing on a widespread basis in our immigration system, and it includes asylum seekers as well. Some of the children that we've met with have been locked up for nine months or longer. In fact, under the current administration, we saw at one point that children were being detained for an average of 89 days, which is far too long. Under the, uh, the law in Flores, the case law in Flores, children are not supposed to be detained for more than an uh, uh, 20 days maximum normally. So a maximum of 72 hours in border patrol facilities, and then a maximum of approximately 20 days in other government facilities, such as family detention centers. But in fact, the uh, current administration was at four and a half times that number in recent years. Um, in addition to that, it's we have done a number of visits to Mexico recently where the migrant protection protocols have been implemented. You'll remember that we talked about that in the second installment of this series. And in that context, we were witnessing these Kafkaesque convoluted pathways in order for people to have a chance to have their claim for asylum be heard. And what we were witnessing, you will recall, was a mother with three children who was being dropped off in one place in Mexico, told that she needed to find her way to another place in Mexico, where she then was given a court date to cross into the United States at three o'clock in the morning and appear for a hearing where she never even met with the judge, was kept in Border Patrol custody for an extended period of time with her children and then transferred to another facility and then released in another part of Mexico and then just be sent through this process all over again at the same time that, for example, a gang might be following the, the, fam the family because they've targeted the mother or one of her children or maybe a, um, a, an abusive ex is targeting the family and trying to track them down in Mexico. So we cannot create these Kafkaesque systems where people are put into this rotating door that's not even a straight rotating door. You you know, it's this convoluted Kafkaesque system that makes absolutely no sense. So we need to get rid of um, these violations of basic due process principles when we reform immigration and asylum laws here in the United States. And then it's also important for us when we modernize this system to recognize that there are new causes for asylum, there are new bases, that historically we've focused a lot on politics and we focused a lot on religion as being in discrimination against people who are in unpopular minority groups groups uh, in countries and that th that was the basis for asylum uh, historically and stereotypically. But in recent years and recent decades, we've seen new particular social groups that we've been able to identify that protect not just men, and generally men who are in power because they are political leaders who belong to the minority group, who have maybe lost power in their government, but these new particular social groups extend to women and children. So for a while there, we were recognizing victims of domestic violence in patriarchal societies where there was a high level of misogyny and that women were subject to um, you know, assaults, beatings, rape by, um, it might be a partner or it might be somebody else. We talked about sex trafficking and the number of girls who are being targeted by gangs in Central America uh, for the purpose of serving as a sex slave or a girlfriend to members of the gangs. We also have talked about some of the boy children who are being targeted by the gangs for recruitment in the gangs. These were starting to be recognized as particular social groups in certain uh, circuit courts in the country. And basically what's happened is that the uh, attorney general has tried to eliminate the recognition of those particular social groups as legitimate bases for asylum here in the United States. And it's critical for us that we be able to move those particular social groups outside of those circuits where they are recognized as being entitled to protection and in fact try and make those institutionalized so that we're able to protect th those children from harm. In addition to modernizing the immigration and asylum laws in the United States, it's also that we modernize our immigration infrastructure. So on the left here, you see one of the uh, statistics, one of the tables that we looked at before, where we saw that although we are nowhere near the highest levels of 
immigration when measured by apprehensions that we've had in recent years, such as in the 80s and then uh, right around the turn of the century, what we're seeing is that we are witnessing more children and families coming to the United States. And that is largely what's given the rise to the crisis that we see today. Because if you ask any Border Patrol agent, and trust me, they tell me this, they were not trained to care for children and families. They were trained to apprehend generally single adults or group of adults who were largely males who were coming to the United States for the purpose of working. They don't have documentation. They're not here to claim asylum. They're not facing a, a, a immediate humanitarian crisis in their own country, um, but they are coming here for jobs. That's what the Border Patrol has historically really been focused on are this type of migration and apprehensions of that population. But what we've seen in recent years are both unaccompanied children and young children with family members, sometimes parents, but sometimes not. And what these kids need is not to be locked up in a border patrol facility, which is what we witnessed in the Clint border patrol facility last June. What they need is medical evaluations, medical screenings. They need to be provided with medical care if there's an immediate need. They need to be evaluated by a social worker. They need to be promptly traced and reunified with their families in the United States. They, are, they need to be provided with education and recreation for the brief period of time that they might need to be in U.S. custody. And the Border Patrol is not trained and staffed to adapt to the type of population that we have coming to the United States today. And it's hurting not only the children and their families, but it's hurting our border patrol too. They want to be on the border apprehending people who might be trying to smuggle drugs into the country, people who might be trying to, to smuggle arms into the country, people who might be traffic trying to traffic these children. But because they're inside and trying expected to change the diapers of kids that they haven't been trained to, uh, to change the diapers of and that they might not have been given the authority to change the diapers of, they're in this catch 22, where they are feeling like they're failing in the task that's been put before them, and they're failing in the task that they had signed up to fulfill when they first signed up to join the Border Patrol. So we really need to modernize our, modern, uh, modernize our immigration infrastructure so that we can process people in a way that makes sense given who's being apprehended today at the U.S. border. In addition to modernizing our laws and modernizing our infrastructure, it's critical that we maintain um, an adherence to basic human rights principles. Now, you know these basic human rights principles because a lot of them were generated from the United States and from our founders. So we've talked about, for example, due process is something that we owe um, you know, these children and their families. But what we also owe them is to keep them together. The global community has come together in support of basic recognition of children's rights that are codified in the UN Committee, or excuse me, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. This is the most widely ratified treaty in the history of the world. The United States contributed more language to this treaty and changed, made more changes to the language submitted by other countries than any other country in the world. Our fingerprints are all over this treaty. And one of the core principles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is that children belong with families. This is a foundational principle. It has not always been adhered to with regard to groups that have experienced severe discrimination under um, our, our country's control historically, including slave families, including Native American families and indigenous families who were broken up and sent to Indian boarding schools where we know that there were widespread instances of abuse and rape. But we now know that what we did was wrong. And we now know that everyone has the right to family. And it's important that we adhere to that principle of keeping families intact and keeping children with their families, with their loved ones, and not break down that family 
because they come from another country, because they come from a, belong to a different race, because they have a different skin color, because they might not have the level of wealth of those in power. So it's critical that we make sure that families are kept together. And when families are separated, we need to make sure that those families are reunited, excuse me. Um, We also need to make sure that our practice of families, our definition of families in America in the 20th century, where we were focused primarily, particularly in the late 20th century, on a nuclear family that consisted of mom and dad and a couple of children, that that is not the definition of family in many countries around the world. In fact, it's not really the definition of family in the United States anymore. We've come to understand that families sometimes are made up of grandparents and and their grandchildren, and that families are sometimes led by a single person and not necessarily by two parents. And we need to learn how to support the families that children belong to in all of their forms, even if they don't mirror our own families. This means recognizing extended families as caregivers. It's really, really common for children coming from the Northern Triangle to be raised by a grandparent or by an auntie or an uncle or by an older cousin. And even if a child arrives with someone other than their parents, if this person is identified as someone who is safe for this child, if this is someone that the child appears to belong to and feel safe with, we need to make sure that we keep that caregiving relationship intact. Right now, the Border Patrol has the authority to grant an exception to keep those families together that are non-traditional, but in my experience, the exemption is seldom granted. So we need to make sure that Border Patrol feels empowered to keep these culturally appropriate families together. Um, Another thing that we need to make sure is that children are no longer locked up. The research is absolutely clear that children not only need to be kept with their families, but they need to be free. And we know from the studies that have been done that find alternative ways to monitor families, monitor people arriving in the United States, track them by providing them with these wraparound services, we know that children not only are harmed by being locked up, but that there's no need for them to be locked up. And this includes using children as bait. It's critical that as we implement a system, modernize a system, and and modernize laws that make sure that the children are with their families and they, they are free. We need to make sure that children are not held in order to pull their families from the shadows of society into the light where they then are apprehended by ICE. That practice was what gave rise to Flores, the Flores case. Remember the Flores case that we talked about um, in both the first and the second installment? That's the case that was brought in the 1980s because the Reagan administration was locking up children in abandoned hotels and keeping them as bait, wouldn't release them to other relatives in order to try and get the parents to come forward so that they then could deport the entire family. I'm not saying people shouldn't be deported. I'm a pretty moderate person. I'm not an extremist. I I recognize that there are some people who don't belong in the United States and that we need to return them to their home countries safely and humanely. But what I am saying is that we have to disaggregate our care for children and reunification of them with their families with our enforcement responsibilities, with our government's enforcement responsibilities, which they have a right and a responsibility to do. The United States government has a right and a responsibility to enforce our immigration laws, but they also have a responsibility to do it humanely. And one way to do that is to disaggregate enforcement from the social services that need to be provided to children as we try and reunify them with their loved ones. Another way that we need to move forward out of this immigration crisis is to identify those families that have been separated and remain separated and to make sure that they are brought together. We keep hearing stories coming out of the Mizell case. So you'll remember the Mizell case, uh, which was Mizell versus ICE. That was the case that was brought by the ACLU on behalf of the 
parents who had been forcibly separated from their children. That was the case that was brought in the United States District Court in San Diego before Judge Dana Sabrow. Judge Sabrow is the one who recognized that all families in the United States, including those who are non-citizens, have a constitutional right to family integrity and that their constitutional right to family integrity was violated when these children were forcefully taken from their parents. So he ordered that those families been reunited, but what we discovered, of course, and we've talked about, is that many of those children and many of those families were not traced. And so there was no tracking of them, and so there still remains what is assumed to be possibly hundreds or even maybe a yeah, thousand families or more who still are waiting to be reunited. But we know that there are still families out there who have not been reunited and we need to put those families back together. We need to right our wrongs, America. We also need to make sure that families that were separated that, and the children who experienced that traumatic separation from their parents and children who were locked up, even if they were locked up with their parents, we know that it's still traumatic for children that they need to be provided with medical and mental health services that they need. So right now we've had a couple of lawsuits that have been brought recently. One was brought by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And that lawsuit, you will recall, is trying to hold the government responsible for the harm that was caused to these children so that these children are being provided with the resources that they need need to recover from the child trauma that the United States government has subjected them to. Rather than make them do that, let's just contact those children directly wherever they are and provide them with the services they need, provide them with the resources rather than drag this out in the courts for years to come and, and delay the children's healing process. In addition to that, it's important that we consider granting those children and families whose rights have been violated, legal status in the United States, so that they're able to achieve stability in their lives and focus on healing. I am not a huge advocate for just going and granting amnesty haphazardly, but in this case, it is absolutely justified in light of what we've done to these kids that we should be granting them and their families amnesty so that they can remain where they are and have stability moving forward as they go through this healing process. Because as I say, all the research around the effects of forced family separation, such as you know, what we did here in the United States, and also locking children up has what can be lifelong effects on them. And it's important for us to try and undo what we've done and right our wrongs as soon as possible. In addition to that, we need to eliminate some of the causes that led to this crisis. We have seen a significant rise in the privatization of our prisons and also the privatization of our immigration facilities. And what we know is that there are numerous facilities in this country who are profiting from locking these children up away from their families in violation of their rights. And one of the first ways to eliminate this problem is to just eliminate all profiteering and make sure that children, the you know, 10, 11% of children who do need to be in government facilities for any length of time are placed as Flores requires in licensed facilities with trained personnel who then can try and place these children in the least restrictive environment possible, such as foster care, so that they then go on to normal lives. One of the saddest moments in, um, in these last few years for me was not just interviewing the children who described being taken from their parents and put into buses and being driven across state lines in the middle of the night, but it was a visit that I took with Michael Bohanek of Human Rights Watch to the Port Isabel Detention Center where we interviewed some of the parents who had been se separated from their children. And one of the saddest parts about this is that even though the children and their parents had the right to maintain contact contact because they had been apprehended together and that's what Flores provides, many of these parents had had almost no contact with their child for weeks or months since the separation occurred. And one of the reasons that was contributing to that is that 
there was a for-profit company that was providing the phone services at Port Isabel Detention Center. And this is a detention center that's been widely criticized historically because of its mistreatment of the people who are, or who are kept there. Um, it's called the corral because they use it to corral it. And it ironically was going to be used as a reunification site for these families who had been separated. But the people who knew the history of Port Isabel and the setup and just what a horrendous site it is, uh, were able to shut that idea down. But in any event, what the parents described is really outrageous sums of money that were being charged to them so that they could try and call their children who were in a distant state, had been placed with strangers, and that they, the parents didn't have the money that they needed to pay for these calls to their children, even though that this was a right that was provided for in Flores. So we need to get the, uh, the profits out of this. I'm sure that some of you have heard about uh, the, the uh, outrageous compensation that was being paid to the CEO of the Southwest Key, which is the company that was running Casa Padre, that Walmart. He was being paid over a million dollars a year. Others of you, of course, have heard about Homestead, which was the military base that was converted into a facility for children in Florida. Um, that is run by Caliburn, which is a private for company, a for profit company, where John Kelly, the former chief of staff for the president of the United States, is on the board of directors, and other various high ranking U.S. military personnel also serve on that board. Um, I've also been to Dilly, which is the South Texas Family Residential Center. That facility is run by Geo Group and CoreCivic. These are two of the largest companies who are involved in the private prison industries. And when you look at the financial analysis of how much it costs for us to keep kids there, it sometimes costs over $500 or over $1,000 a day to have these kids in, the, in these facilities when in fact they have, 89% of them have family or other loved ones in the United States who could be caring for them for free. So we re really need to get the profiteering out of this entire area of, um, you know, of, of United States practices and get these kids where they belong, which is with family. It also, and this is a huge one, and I, I don't mean to, um, I don't, mean to make it seem light, like this is going to be an easy thing to do, but it wouldn't be a presentation with integrity if we didn't acknowledge that we have to end the climate crisis if we are going to get migration to moderate levels. All of the modeling that's done around the climate crisis shows that we're going to have a huge human migration in the 21st century if we don't get the crisis under control. So if we want to keep migration at a reasonable, healthy level, then we really need to make sure that we limit the number of natural disasters that might occur as a result of the, of the climate crisis. In addition to that, we are already seeing migration to the United States from children who live in the highlands, for example, of Guatemala. Their family is facing a drought and have been facing a drought for several years now where they were doing subsistence farming and there simply is not enough food to feed the family. And so the older children are coming to the United States looking for jobs because their family can't support them in their home country. And so this isn't something that's gonna you know, happen, not happen, until 2050 or 2070. This is something that we're already seeing now in our interviews of the children, that we're already seeing migration as a result of the climate crisis. And it's important for us to be um, you know, both prepared for it at the same time that we try and reduce the climate changes that are occurring so that people can stay in their home country as long as possible and have their needs met and keep that migration to moderate levels. In addition to that, we need to make sure that we are fostering economic uh, prosperity abroad. Many of you are familiar with colonialism and the highly uh, impactful uh, repercussions of colonialism, that we have many countries who have only been in a post-colonial state for less than uh, half a century, and that they need our help through trade, through stimulus, uh, through stimuli, um, through uh, 
tourism and other things that will allow them to develop some economic uh, stability in their home country so that they have jobs for young people, so that they have businesses that are successful. And we need to invest in other countries, uh, both through aid and through uh, trade and, and different partnerships so that they can become economically independent and recover from the exploitation that many of these countries uh, have been subject to for centuries now. Finally, it's critical that we need to elect leadership with integrity. Now, I, I had a hard time picking, pick, picking a picture for this slide because I didn't want to do anything that's partisan. As you all know from the first two presentations that I gave, I am a, a nonpartisan person. I have very strong political opinions, but some of them fall to the right and some of them fall to the left and many of them fall to the middle. I tend to be very much um, a pra pragmatic optimist who believes in the best of humanity. And so um, in, in choosing this picture, um, I chose a picture of me with my two daughters because uh, in the last few years, we have become more and more politically involved as we've gotten more and more concerned about the departure from American values under this, the current administration, uh, including with respect to the mistreatment of children and families at the border. Now, I don't care whether you support someone who's a Republican or a Democrat or Green Party or Independent or whatever. I come from a purple family. I belong to all of those parties. But what is important is that you recognize that we have the privilege of living in a country where we, if we are unhappy with our government, we get to replace our government. And that requires us to get politically involved, which is what I've been trying to do, which was what my, my kids and our friends and families and colleagues and others all around the country have been trying to do is to get politically involved and say, this inhumanity has got to stop. Again, it doesn't mean that we have to open our borders and let everybody in. It doesn't mean that everyone who's here now needs to be allowed to stay. But what it does mean is that we need to elect leaders who will take concrete steps to modernize our immigration and asylum laws, to modernize our arrivals and, um, and, uh, and asylum system, that we need to make sure that we are combating the problems that are leading to uh, increased migration uh, to our southern border and, and elsewhere, frankly, and that we need to come together as a nation and elect leadership that will create a, a new and better system that is more humane, consistent with American ideals, consistent with American laws, and you'll have to identify who those individuals are um, you know, for yourself on an individual basis, but the important thing is that we recognize what's been happening and we take steps to end it. And with that, I'd like to open up to questions. All right, we have a few questions. The first question is having seen the situation and these conditions firsthand, what have you noticed about this crisis that's not necessarily being emphasized in the media? So what have I noticed about, so I think that the biggest, um, one of my biggest frustrations with the media coverage is that similar to what we, okay, similar to what we talked about when I talked about the importance of educating the public and the, um, policymakers, I think we also have to educate the press. So that, for example, when I talk to the media about what we are seeing in Mexico right now through MPP, we are seeing children who are being uh, uh, sexually abused and assaulted at an outrageous level. You know, they are being, we're seeing children who are being kidnapped, we're seeing children who are being molested, we're seeing parents who are being raped, and um, we need to do a much better job of helping the press to understand that the children who are in MPP right now, that they would be in the United States with their family, but for this policy that was resurrected from the 1990s and then implemented by this administration and is placing children in 
horrific conditions in Mexico, many of whom are now subject to the control of gangs. So when you're talking about the kids in Matamoros, they are not free there because that is an area that is a level four security zone. That means that the United States government says, if you go in there, we cannot protect you. And we're sending little kids into that area without any meaningful shelter, without any meaningful provisions. And like I said, the majority of these kids have family in the United States, a significant number of them have the right to be here as asylum seekers who meet the criteria for asylum in the United States. And yet the media doesn't seem to understand that those children are in constructive US custody, that they are in 2020, the children of Clint in 2019. So right now, the current number of children in U.S. custody is uh, about 4,400 are the most recent numbers that, that I've received. Um, that's down from 14,000 at times last year, which were some of the highest numbers that we've ever seen. And when you think about where are those children, um, we believe that a significant number of those children are in Mexico. Approximately 60,000 people have been sent to Mexico for protection, but as we've seen from our interviews there, there is no protection under MPP. All right, our next question. There are many people that believe that policies such as separation of parent and child at the border are necessary. How do you suggest engaging in productive conversation if we hope to convince them that this belief is misguided? So for that question, I think it's really important for us to all remember something that we seem to have forgotten about four years ago which is that part of talking to people doesn't involve moving your mouth at all. It involves closing your mouth and just listening. That people won't listen to us if we don't listen to them. And I'm sorry, I know I'm saying this after talking for 48 minutes straight, so I'm such a hypocrite. But you know, the fact is, is that if we want to teach people we have to be open to learning from them, that you talk to any teacher and they will tell you that they learn as much or more from their students as, as our students learn from us. So it's really important for us to engage in conversations where we ask people, well, why do you think that? Why, why is that necessary? And you know, how do you think you would feel if that happened? Why do you think that they're coming here? And why do you think their parents would bring them here? You know, if, if, um, if in fact, um, all, they knew that all these bad things were going to happen to them. And it's in that dialogue, in that process of not just talking, but listening, that I think that people will open up their minds and more importantly, their hearts to us. Right now, it feels like we are closing ourselves off from one another because we all feel under attack. I think that we've had this amplification of values and opinions that has happened partially as a result of having so much access to one another via the internet. And then there are all these channels which amplify it. And we've identified different sources of information that we've come to trust and other sources of information that we've come to distrust. And we've started to lock ourselves off. And so we're not really as open to one another as we need to be if we're going to engage in a dialogue in which we're really learning and growing from one another. So I suggest that you have conversations in which you try and connect with the person's heart first, and that only after you connect with their heart are you able to give them arguments that will connect with their head. We know that we are far more emotional than we want to admit as human beings, and so we've got to take the time to actually connect with other people at an emotional level first, where we care about them and we're conveying that we care about them um, you know, before we get into the intellectual arguments about why we need to do this or do that. What does this mean? It means really uncomfortable Thanksgiving dinners, everyone, and I'm sorry. I know that we're all locked up together right now, but soon enough, we're going to conquer this coronavirus, and we're going to start to come back together with our larger family groups, and that means maybe inviting Uncle Sean to Thanksgiving, even though you know that it's going to make for a very lively dialogue, but try and keep the liveliness to a low level so that Uncle Sean feels heard and that you have the opportunity to reconnect with him so that when it's your turn to talk, he'll listen. Thank you. Our third and final question. As you have helped rally our citizens to speak out against imprisoning children, 
what have you seen as the most effective way to get our government's attention and cause them to make change on this practice? You know, I, um, I don't even know how to answer that because I, you know, I, I, I sometimes am told things that make me really proud. Like maybe we did help the government to change. For example, we have the replacement of the El Paso sector chief who, um, he was a hardliner. He was really, really bad news. He thought that if he made children and families lives really horrific, that they would stop coming. But we know from the numbers that they didn't stop coming, even after these harsh immigration policies and practices were introduced and then you know, were, were put out into the media and were known around the world, people kept coming. So when he was demoted and sent to um, Detroit, you, you can imagine how bad the immigration problem is in Detroit, but um, when, when he was demoted, he was replaced with somebody who is said to be really engaging with the local nonprofits. Uh, the new sector chief is trying to get beds in Clint and the other facilities. She said to be trying to uh, diversify the meals, serve more hot meals, healthier meals. Um, the children are said to be kept there a shorter period of time. When people on the ground tell me, you know what, we're, we're seeing fewer children, better conditions, that makes me happy. But at the same time, I go across the border and I interview these kids. One little boy who had been, I talked to you about him before, I believe, where he had been you know, sexually abused um, or assaulted three times between October and we met, we met with him in January. Now, the good news, and he was developmentally dis dis delayed. He was six years old, functioned as a three-year-old, appeared to have a cognitive disability. Las Americas down in El Paso, God bless them, they tried again and again and again to get him across the border legally by relying on the published exceptions to MPP, to the migrant protection protocols. But the government kept sending him back. The last time they sent him back, they gave him a test with 13 questions including one of which was, what is your name? He got 10 of those 13 questions wrong, including what is your name? And they still sent this little boy back. Now, I'm so happy to tell you that last week, Las Americas was able to work with the US government and that little boy is now in the United States with his family where he belongs. And you know he is now safe, but there are still thousands of children down in Mexico who are not safe. And I sometimes, try and let myself feel okay about some of the changes that the government has made, but then I can't rest too long or be too you know, joyful because I recognize that there are still all these other kids who are being mistreated by our government um, because they're still locked up, you know, those 3,400 kids or because they've been sent to Mexico and are being put through this Kafkaesque system. So I think that I'm not the best person to tell you how to get the government to do the right thing. I can tell you that we have had, we at Willamette and we brought in people from Stanford and Albert Einstein and Harvard that we went and elsewhere that we put together a whole team of experts and we went to Capitol Hill and we did two full days of briefing and we had every single meeting slot booked all day, both days, we had standing room only at both of the congressional briefings that we did. You know, will it make a difference? I don't know, but do we need to keep trying? Absolutely, because as you all know, our motto is not unto ourselves alone are we born. So we'll keep trying and we hope you will too. Thank you so much for coming today and thank you so much, Eric, for hosting us. Well, thank you, Professor Binford, for your engaging and informative presentation and for giving your time to spread awareness and address the Americans' border crisis. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation and would like to see Warren's previous webinars in this series, as well as other Willamette-oriented contact, stay tuned for the official launch of our WooStream virtual programming platform. And finally, thank you for tuning in tonight. None of this would be possible without viewers like you. Thanks, everyone.